This is Lecture 1, Managing Sport Facilities and History and Future of Sport. When we talk about managing sport facilities, we look in the text when we look at history of sport and the need for facilities. And we see the evolution of facilities in regards to professional stadiums, collegiate stadiums, and Olympic stadiums. And we all know Olympic stadiums originated uh, in Greece, and that's the formation of uh, modern-day sport as we know it. Uh, managing sport facilities, uh, when we talk about professional stadiums versus collegiate stadiums, and the growth has been absolutely uh, enormous, uh, mostly on the professional side. Um, colleges do uh, get new stadiums uh, through revenue building through their universities and um, a lot of funding. But when we talk about professional stadiums, that's where we see the amount of growth um, skyrocket. And that's kind of the exciting part. Uh, we see that on TV a lot. Um, and some of the newer pieces, newer stadiums that we see um, in regards to uh, NBA, where the New Jersey Nets have a new stadium in Brooklyn, a new arena in Brooklyn. Um, and then the NFL with the San Francisco 49ers out in Santa Clara. And we see in our text um, in the second edition that these numbers that we're looking at when we talk about construction since the 1980s um, is rather old, old material. It was a 2005 survey that was taken and put data in the textbook, and we know how many stadiums um, and arenas have been built uh, since 2005. Many key marquee arenas, like I just mentioned, um, with the New Jersey Nets, the NBA, and Levi Stadium um, with the NFL and San Francisco 49ers. So those are the two of the, of the bigger ones, and also the Dallas uh, Cowboys has been since then. So some major, major growth has occurred um, on the professional side. And very interesting, a lot of fun uh, facts about those stadiums that we'll get into a little bit more, but uh, neat for us to be able to see and talk about it. Uh, funding for sports facilities. Uh, when we talk about how sports facilities um, evolve from the designing phase all the way through to building, you can do research on any specific stadium and it will show you that there are a lot of different sources for um, funding to build them. So there's private funding when you have a, a millionaire, gazillionaire I'll call them, who wants to fund uh, the building uh, solely out of their own pocket. Most often those are um, groups of folks that come together to do that. Um, there's also government funding where the government, uh, whether that's city, state, local government, takes ownership of partial most often, which would be uh, land rights where the team would rent uh, from the city or government. And then sometimes you have a combination of both, private and government. Um, and some examples of that, you know, we talked about Levi Stadium briefly. And you'll see, uh, if you do some research on that, and I encourage you to do that, um, some of the latest research on the, since 2014 published, published um, research shows um, that it cost originally for Levi Stadium, where the San Francisco 49ers currently play, originally was projected at $937 million. And then by 2014, upon completion of the project, you see the project costs go to $1.31 billion with a B. And you'll see also the um, stadium funding was split quite differently. Um, and the overall outtake of that by 2014 was 71% of that funding was going to come from stadium authority is what they call it. And basically it's loans from banks um, and then a stadium affiliate, which includes seat licenses amongst other income revenue streams. Um, and you'll see the city of Santa Clara also plan to cover costs in there as well. Uh, taxes were invoked and mostly for um, hotels near the stadium where there will be new taxes to cover the costs um, on that. So they were a little bit tricky on how they did that, not necessarily tax dollars, but they taxed um, hotel revenue 
from the area. So there are all different ways to do that. And that's a, a one example of, uh, of a way that, that it worked for San Francisco 49ers and the Levi Stadium Project. So when we talk about sports facilities and we take a look back at Beijing uh, in the Olympics 2008, the estimated cost for their facilities was $3.4 billion. And we are aware that Beijing was the highest, um, let's say, uh, they spent the most amount of money on any Olympics to date. Um, and a lot of it was stadium renovation and stadium builds. And again, estimated cost for those facilities was $3.4 billion. 37 stadiums um, and arenas were built or renovated. But the key question is the use of facilities after the Olympics. Was it worth it or not? Now, if you know anybody who's traveled to Beijing or has a vested interest in those stadiums or arenas, you will hear that a lot of the arenas are not being used. Um, what you're looking at on the screen is the Aqua Dome. I think they called it the Aqua Dome, which is where the aquatics facilities um, were. Um, the also, uh, something called the bird's nest, which was where opening ceremonies were held. And those are relatively unused. Um, no um, tenant has taken ownership of that. There were rumors of an NBA team coming into China to take ownership of one of their facilities. Um, and that um, deal didn't go through for one reason or another. But there have been opportunities like that to take some of the existing stadiums and arenas that were built for the Olympics and actually bring revenue back into Beijing to be able to maintain and uphold those facilities. Um, and uh, now we're in 2015, so we're seven years out from those Olympics, and a lot of those facilities have yet to be used to their full capacity. When we talk about facility management in general, we see people um, are placed um, in positions to manage, and those people perform tasks and duties. Um, those managers wear a lot of hats, and if any of you have been actively involved in sport management in, in any way, you'll know that that's true. Um, when it comes to planning, marketing, scheduling, building operations, and coordinating with people, those are all a very key components into running a facility. And every facility needs a manager or CEO that takes these leads and oftentimes delegates duties down, but ultimately is responsible for um, the facility management in itself. So when we talk about some of the bigger facilities, like here in Los Angeles, we have the Staples Center, Angel Stadium of Anaheim, StubHub Center that house um, professional sports teams. Those um, facility general managers uh, delegate duties down, but they're ultimately responsible for all aspects of operations um, of the facility. And those managers um, use their resources wisely. So again, general managers will delegate duties down and supervise different um, areas, um, place people in areas of expertise where they're uh, most confident to perform their duties, and that means uh, employees and having mentors in place. A lot of times that means having a, um, a master overseer over particular employees so that they have someone to lean on and ask questions, folks who have been in those shoes before. Um, management teams that would come together collectively. Oftentimes you would find the directors of departments come together for weekly meetings to divulge um, best practices amongst themselves and what works best for the synergy of the team and for the arena or the stadium. And also boards, boards of directors, managing boards or committees are very helpful to uh, general managers of facilities that would give an outside look um, that could possibly help with situations and scenarios and would be um, almost a sounding board for the general manager to gain insight and help and support also. And these boards are usually made up of high-end executives who have been in the industry or are retired, have been actively involved. Some are uh, wealthy individuals who um, give back 
to the community and give back and have a vested interest in the stadium itself. Um, so those key um, components are really important and critical for a manager um, to be able to use their resources wisely. When we talk about role players, when we manage a sport facility, you have three key categories. Customers, um, those also are your promoters of your product, and ticket buyers. Ticket buyers um, bring in your revenue. Promoters will sell your product, your game, your arena to their friends, family, and those that they know. Uh, very important that you're selling a good product and that you're putting your best foot forward with your customers. They're major role players in your facility succeeding. In addition to that, there are internal constituents that are looked at. Those are your board members, the owners, the employees and co-workers that have a very vested interest in your product, which is your arena, um, your stadium, sometimes includes the land, sometimes includes the team, and those folks really want to know what's happening and they want to be very involved. External constituents can make or break your stadium. So bankers who invest, and we talk about Levi Stadium where the San Francisco 49ers play, there's, uh, there were relationships with banks, obviously, to be able to pull off a $1.31 billion project. And 71% of that stadium uh, build were on loans from banks and stadium affiliates. Came out to $621 million that came from bank loans and stadium affiliates. So bankers are very key in your facility. Uh, politicians can uh, sell your facility to get paperwork and red tape processed through and media or media will also just like politicians sell your project and one example of that happening now when we talk about a build and we talk about potential you'll see here in Los Angeles the rumors around the mill about the St. Louis Rams coming to Los Angeles and potentially buying the Hollywood Park site that's an area where you'll see um, media taking a big uh, step in and um, here in Los Angeles there's been a lot of newsworthy information out about the St. Louis Rams taking ownership and landing here at the uh, Hollywood Park site. So uh, those are your external constituents and internal constituents and your customers all together are very uh, crucial role players for your facility. When we talk about a mission statement um, every company organization should have a mission statement with goals and objectives. Um, it's no different when you manage a sport facility. Sport facilities should be run as a legitimate business. So goals and objectives are uh, critically important. Uh, goals should be a little more lengthy and laid out where your objective um, should also have some detail to it and your mission statement should be clear-cut. There are some examples of those um, in the text. One thing to keep in mind when you look at plans, you look at a strategic plan and an operational plan. You know, what's the difference? A strategic plan is more of a long-term view and a strategic plan is a roadmap. Um, an operational plan is day-to-day -day business operations and how you're going to get your strategic plan uh, moving and operational. So operation is um, in very easy terms, day-to-day -day operations, and strategic plan is more long-term view. And when we talk about plans, you talk about short-term and long-term plans, those develop your business plan. So again, we talk about mission statement, goals and objectives, strategic and operational plans. In a sport facility, there also needs to be a business plan. And again, want to emphasize the fact that running a sport facility or managing a sport facility is really no different than running a company and and some folks don't look at it the same and it absolutely is it's running a business and it has to have all the strategic pieces in place and a solid business plan and we'll get more into that as we look deeper into some of the planning phases throughout this course